everybody please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Cheryl, will you take roll, please? Here. Present. Here. 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 So I am looking for um, the um, like to excuse both uh, Councilwoman Dunley and Councilman um, <laughs> DeYoung. I move that we excuse um, Councilman Dunley and Councilman DeYoung. Okay. So, if you okay. so I have a first and a second by um, Cornegay and Kinzer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is opposed? Okay. So um, approval of the agenda. Madam Mayor, I make a motion to uh, approve the agenda as presented. Okay. So, uh, motion to approve the agenda by Council um, Person Kinzer and Owen. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. Looking for the consent agenda. Approval of the consent agenda. I make a motion that we accept the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have a discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So motion carries for the consent agenda, approval of the consent agenda. So we're going to move right into uh, special recognition. And I'm going to try to keep it together. I'm going to ask Patsy to come forward, please. I'm <laughs> 
I wanted to say that Cassie is very meticulous. I don't know if, uh, if you all know this. We do here at the city, but we had wonderful audits. So we're audited every year by the state, and uh, they do different ratings, and we always get the highest rating. And, uh, and in fact, it's, it's so good. She does such a great job that they, they have to find just a little something that we need to, you know, maybe think about working on because they just can't give us that perfect score that we always get A's. We always do because we're so meticulous and so good. So, anyway, um, uh, do you want to say something before I present the award? Oh, you want to do the award. Whatever you want to do. So I'll go ahead and present the okay. award. So um, what we have here is this is being presented. It's a really beautiful plan. <laughs> and this is being presented to Patsy um, for distinguished service to the people of Cedro Woolley as the finance director from April 16, 2001 to June 15, 2018. Your steady judgment successfully navigated the city through good times and bad with excellent results. Cedro Woolley is a better place to live in.
he had to have the worst job in the city, all those bar fights, who was shoot man in, and he said, no, Patsy, you have the worst job in the city. You have to look at numbers all day, and the computer screen, people yell at you because something or other is wrong with the utility bill. He said, you have the worst job. And as we went back and forth over who had the best and who had the worst job, it dawned on both of, both of us that we each have our skills and our areas of expertise, and together, we can work together, we can cooperate, and we can make the city run better and leaner because we're all helping each other. So I do appreciate the various departments that have worked over the years. And I do still believe that the finance, finance director position is the best. <laughs> I've had the privilege of working with a great city supervisor and several excellent mayors, and um, appreciate each of you as well. In contemplating my retirement, one of my mom's old sayings came to mind about one bad apple spoiling the barrel. So I was indeed very nervous about who might be the next finance director was trying to light a fire under air and hire somebody so that, you know, we could be sure we got the best person. And um, I was greatly relieved and actually amazed to some degree when Doug agreed to come to work for the city. Um, Doug had known Doug for years, and I respect Doug. I've uh, sought his advice on several occasions. He has great experience in the world of government finance. And will continue the, um, leading the department in excellence as we proceed on to the next um, part of the city's future. Um, while I will miss people, I hear Route 66 calling my name <laughs> and the other sites of America, so I look forward to uh, sending you email pictures of all the great things I see about our trip. <laughs> so it has been an honor to work with the city these years. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to staff reports and we'll start with you, Officer Eaton. So uh, we had an incident back on the 17th uh, in the morning of. Uh, our two night shift officers uh, located uh, a stolen motorcycle and a stolen vehicle from out in the county. Uh, we ended up recovering a, another stolen vehicle from out in the county and a uh, later in the middle of town a vehicle that was stolen from that area but that was in the city. Uh, we ended up having a foot pursuit we could call it that, uh, across the middle of town and back and forth for a few hours. Uh, we ended up locating the, the suspect and taking him into custody. Uh, but uh, the investigation into it is very ongoing. Uh, I want to thank everybody's cooperation, especially from city, city staff, uh, for the lockdown that we did down on Alexander Street. Um, we've reached out to some of the staff and asked for any suggestions or any things that they had problems with during the uh, lockdown, and uh, there's definitely some things we're going to work on uh, as we go forward. Uh, we had uh, two large drug busts inside the city, um, one in April and one just this last week. The first one was on Cook Road, uh, where a very large amount of meth and heroin were located. Uh, I'm not going to say too many details on that because no suspect's been arrested yet and we're still investigating that. Um, we had another incident, uh, in, like I said, last week, uh, where a search warrant was obtained by a county task force from outside Skagit <laughs> County that was served on the east end of Highway 20 in the city and uh, several pounds of meth and uh, multiple pounds of heroin were located. Uh, there is one suspect in custody on that uh, and the subject that was arrested has only been out of prison for six months uh, for a prior drug issue. Uh, very, very large weight. Uh, more weight than I've seen in my 15 years of career here in Cedar Woolley. Um, on both incidents, I've never seen so many drugs together. Wow, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the outside task forces. Yeah, that's all I got. Thank you. That's a lot. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Chief Klinger? I always hate following these guys. <laughs> I, I, um, not much has changed since Monday, so I don't have too much to report other than uh, we have another uh, drill with the high school coming up tomorrow morning. Uh, if anybody's interested, it'll be at 9 o'clock, and it's more of a uh, of a reunification drill for the high school. Uh, they're working on that, but it is uh, going to be staged not as a shooting incident, but as a hazardous materials spill there uh, at Central School. So uh, we we have that going on tomorrow, and, and the police and fire will both be involved in that. Thank you. John? Uh, I've got a lot of information for the council coming up later, so I'll keep it brief. I just want to mention um, the, the the building downtown that burned and has been restored. Uh, the grass is getting tall. I'm aware of it. I'm working with the property owner, soon-to-be property owner, that hasn't closed yet to get that uh, fence taken down and get them on a grass mowing um, uh, pattern so they, they can come regularly and keep, hopefully keep it mowed. So I'll, I'm working on that one, in case anybody's asked. <laughs> Thank you. Mark? structures on the plant, which is just downstream of our, our uh, uh, screw pumps, is um, hydraulically a problem for us under high water events when we have uh, intense rainfalls like we seem to be having at a more increasing frequency these days. Uh, we've been near overtopping that particular structure uh, three times in the last couple of months, uh, or at least when it was raining here a month or so ago. And also, uh, we've discovered that we have a differential in the height of our two clarifiers. Those are the round structures out there that are the final part of our treatment process. All of those have caused some issues for us, both with treatment and with hydraulics. Uh, we do have a short-term fix uh, for all of those that we, we think will work. Uh, what I'm proposing to do tonight is to move forward with uh, Brown and Caldwell moving into a design phase to do those short-term fixes. There will be other things that have been identified, excuse me, in the larger uh, capacity study that we'll be addressing over the next 10 years. Uh, they're, they're not huge, but there are other things to, to tune up the process and keep the plant operating for as long as we can before we do a major upgrade. Uh, this one tonight uh, comes to you with some uh, time uh, crunch involved. Uh, we hope to build the hydraulic improvements that would fix uh, most of these problems uh, over the next few months before the rain season starts again next year. Brown and Caldwell provided the estimate for the design work while I was off on bereavement leave and I just had time to uh, open it up and look at it this morning and, and part of that is that we need to award this work by uh, the 29th of May in, in order for them to be able to get the design out in time to bid it this year and get it done. So I bring it to you tonight with that, uh, with that um, urgency to it, uh, their estimate for the work which would design the fixes for those problems I mentioned, at least the last three, uh, is uh, uh, $55,463. Uh, That's a cost not to exceed. Uh, their scope of services is attached to the agreement and uh, I'm recommending that we move forward. Uh, Brown and Caldwell, this is actually a new contract that we're proposing for this. Uh, they've been working under a 2015 contract on all of the assessment work. This is actually design phase. 
Uh, we did our consultant selection back in 2015 anticipating that if they performed acceptably on that work, we would move into the design phase without an additional consultant selection process. So I'm comfortable to bring this to you tonight to recommend that we award a new contract to them uh, for the design phase work to follow up on the capacity assessment and uh, to include phase one of that, which would be the short-term fixes. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them. But my recommendation is that we award this to Brown and Caldwell and move forward with this. Mark. Marsh, you, you spoke on this um, quite in depth that the strategic planning retreat didn't show. This I is did. the, we're already familiar with this. Yeah, OK. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mark, I just had one question on uh, page two, the back page, where time is critical. What is the um, 2018 construction that's referenced? So would that be what you're referring to as like a phase two? The phase one, uh, the 2018 construction would, would really be uh, three things. Uh, we would install, uh, we would raise the walls on the uh, uh, grit tank weir box, uh, it's a concrete structure, we'd raise those about 18 inches. That gives us uh, more room for the hydraulic uh, system to, to rise as the water is trying to go through during the high storm events. Uh, we would create a, a new uh, path from uh, the, uh, uh, the downstream uh, box, uh, distribution box, uh, to the um, aeration basin, which removes a, a hydraulic bottleneck we knew have uh, due to the fact that we're operating with the third, uh, with another problem, which is we're not currently using the tank that's under our operations lab building. That's creating right. a, a bottleneck uh, due to using the old plant, plant path from before the 98 expansion. This will give us another way of getting the flow over and uh, getting around that bottleneck. And the third one is to put in a structure that would allow us to equalize the differential in the two clarifiers. Those are the short-term things that they would design and that we would implement this year. Thank you. Would the council like to make a motion on that now? Mm -hmm. Are you open to that? I move to authorize Mayor Johnson to execute professional services agreement number 2018-PS-21 with Brown and Caldwell Incorporated of Seattle, Washington for wastewater treatment plant improvements design, including phase one hydraulic system improvements for a cost not to exceed $55,463. Second. So I have a motion by um, Council Member Cornegay, seconded by Council Member Couch to approve the motion. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, the motion to authorize Mayor Johnson to exec execute professional services agreement number 2018 PS21 with Brown and Caldwell Inc. of Seattle, Washington for the waste water treatment plant improvements design including phase one hydraulic system improvement for the cost not to exceed $55,463 $55, has been passed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council. Anything else, Mark? Yes, I do have a couple of other things if you will bear with me for another few minutes. Um, I mentioned also at the retreat uh, the possibility of uh, three things coming down to us through uh, actions recently taken by the Council of Government's Policy Board. Uh, the first was one of the contingency projects that we submitted uh, accompanying the uh, 2017 grant request for the STP uh, Surface Transportation Program funding that they administer for the county. Uh, that, that project has been moved forward as a uh, real project now, and we've been authorized to move forward with, with obligating that. That will provide an additional $100,000 for the city to do uh, the Jones John Liner Trail Road scoping study. As I mentioned to you when we were awarding that to Reichardt and Eby, the 100000 that we put forward uh, from local funds for that was not enough to completely do the project, and we were kind of going to cobble together as much as we could with those funds. This will provide the rest of the funds we need to do a, uh, a more than adequate job of, of getting that uh, quarter project outlined and ready to move forward to uh, grant application stage. 
So that's good news for us. Uh, the only downside to it is it does federalize the uh, entire set of projects that will follow. Uh, we'll have to follow federal environmental rules and, and other things. Uh, because it is not a state route, it does remove some of the requirements that we had to fulfill, for instance, on Highway 9, where we had to look at a sound wall. That, will, that won't apply to this route, fortunately, but there are other things that are going to make it more difficult to administer, but still, uh, we need the money, and it, it's, a, it's a worthwhile trade-off on this one. Uh, timing is also an issue with this. And the reason that the, the policy board moved that forward is uh, we have about a million four uh, in funds that comes to us from the federal government on a yearly basis that we're required to obligate or we are in danger of being sanctioned to where we could lose that obligation for a year. Uh, we, as a group, we kind of had all of our eggs in one basket with a project in Mount Vernon that was a million six and would have met our obligation for 2018. Uh, and they, they have been telling us for a year and a half that they would have that project uh, obligated by, uh, by the requirement of July 31st. Unfortunately, they haven't met that. Uh, the time for us to react is getting very narrow now. Uh, any project that goes forward has to go through a four to six week process of review uh, at both the state and the, uh, at, at the state level basically, uh, council governments and state level. So we've got about eight weeks at this point uh, to get there. Uh, it, it's getting very close. So what the council of governments did is um, they've moved forward these contingency projects. Ours is one of five. We'll need to obligate those. In order for me to do that, I need to have the paperwork in with about, within about two weeks. So I won't have an opportunity to bring that prospectus and agreement package to council before I submit it. And I'm requesting tonight that you uh, authorize uh, us to move forward with the application. I will have it reviewed by the mayor and Aaron uh, before sending that in. And I'll bring it to you for ratification at the meeting on the 13th. Uh, but I'll, I'll have to submit it before then. Um, the other thing is I also mentioned that there were two projects that have been funded by Council of Governments, uh, but for future years, uh, they were the uh, SR9 Township, uh, SR20 Intersection Improvements Project, which was a little over a million dollars, and the SR20 Cascade Trail Phase 2A Project, which is from Holt Camp to Hodgen Road. That's uh, an extension of our shared use path uh, on Highway 20, out that additional 3,000 feet roughly. Uh, they also have uh, decided to, to request that the agencies uh, move forward with obligating any design projects, and both of those have design phases. Same issue for that. Uh, I need to have that paperwork in uh, in time for it to be obligated or approved by the uh, local programs in Olympia by July 31st, and I need to do that as quickly as possible. Um, it's going to be a fair amount of work for me to do that, uh, and I need to get going on it really this week in order to make all that happen. I think it's a good idea both for the region so that uh, we can participate and not being sanctioned and losing our funding for next year. Um, and uh, we don't have to actually build the projects this quickly, uh, but we will be uh, selecting consultants at the end of this year for at least the one and get them in line. So kind of a paper thing right now, but timing is tight. So my request to you is to authorize us to move forward with all three of those projects for the, uh, the uh, prospectus and agreement uh, paperwork to DOT to be ratified um, as soon as I can get that to you uh, in June. So you're looking for us to authorize to move forward with the paperwork to DOT for all three of the grants? Is that what you're asking? That's correct. And the projects in particular are um, the um, Jones John Liner Trail Road scoping study. That's number one. The second one is the SR20, SR9 Township Intersection Improvements. That's number two. And the third one is the SR20 Cascade Trail uh, Phase 2A uh, Sidewalk Project or Shared Use Path Project. And those would be for the design phase only for all of those. Madam Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, I'd like to authorize Public Works Director Freiberger to proceed 
uh, with the necessary paperwork with DOT, reference the SR20 State Route 9 Township Intersection Project, the Jones-John Liner Trail Road Scoping Study, the SR20 Cascade Trail Project, uh, to proceed forward to secure funding from the Council of Government. Okay. Okay. So I have a motion by Councilman Couch and seconded by uh, Councilman Owen. Any discussion? All Mark, in favor? Oh. Does that, Mark, does that hit everything, that, the projects that we needed to? It does on those, okay. yes. Yes, it does indeed. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right, so uh, the council has authorized um, Mark to move forward with the design and the funding for the Jones John Liner project, the SR20 S9 township improvement, and the SR20 phase two sidewalk improvement. Is so I wish I could say I'm done, but I'm not quite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to make you aware uh, we held the pre construction conference for the Fruitdale project today, and that work will start. Uh, they're going to mobilize on the 29th and start their actual work on the 4th. Uh, the basic schedule is they're going to have two crews working out there. Uh, one will be working on the section of uh, Fruitdale from McGargle north to the northern state's entrance, working on the new sidewalk on the uh, east side of the road uh, and prepping for the overlay uh, that will uh, take place later on that. They'll also have a separate crew working north of the intersection out to the city limits, uh, starting with repairing the slide area, uh, which we're all anxious to see, and then putting in the sewer main that, that goes in in front of those existing four uh, residences there north of the intersection. Uh, that work is going to be going concurrently. Uh, they'll come back, uh, or not come back, but after those are well along, they're going to do the roundabout itself about the last week of July. They'll start on that. and close that intersection all together and, and build that new mini roundabout that's planned for that. So their, their schedule calls for them to be complete by the second week of September, which is a, a good uh, tight schedule on that. Uh, David Lee is, is working to get the um, sidewalk project from Fruitdale to Township out to bid in the next two weeks. And he's also trying to do the State Street overlay at the same time. I mentioned in the uh, retreat that we're struggling to get the other two projects we plan to build done. Uh, it's getting kind of late for us to do that, and I'm considering seeing if we can find a consultant to help with at least one of those. I'll be working on that and reporting back to you at the next council session on that. Uh, we'll probably have to do some kind of a selection process on that, but uh, we have two contractors we've recently selected, one for that, that sidewalk project from Fruitdale to um, I mean, from uh, Township to Fruitdale and also um, uh, the Jones-John Liner Road. We may just pick one of those and see if we can fit that into their schedule to get those done. Projects that are at risk are the uh, sidewalk and ADA ramp upgrade uh, around town and the uh, sewer project on West Bennett and uh, Beatty. Uh, that particular one, the sewer, is more critical because we know that Habitat is relying on us to be done with that uh, sometime around July of next year. Uh, the last thing I want to report to you is uh, we did six, uh, uh, submit uh, two grant applications uh, just before I left uh, on the 11th, uh, one for the Skagit County Economic Development Funds for the SR20 West Lane Widening Project. We partnered with Skagit County, as you know, on that to submit one that would not only widen uh, the highway there in the vicinity of Light Care and for the new behavioral health, I, I don't remember the name they've given that now, it's something different than that. Uh, we'll call it that for now. And, uh, yes, John knows what it is. Um, uh, we're partnering with them to not only do the lane widening, but, but put in a uh, bridge over Brickyard Creek. And we've had discussions with the life care folks, and they're amenable to uh, doing a joint approach and getting rid of the uh, culvert there that gives us some problems when we have these high flow events. So that's a good win-win for everyone. Uh, we also submitted a uh, wash dot bike ped uh, 
application for the uh, John, uh, for John Liner Road to add a shared use path on the north side of that. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens with those. There's another grant opportunity out there I just want to make a, what you aware of. Uh, the former Tiger program from the feds that funds rather large projects is open and closing on July the 19th. I'm trying to think what I'd want to do with that if we had it and also how we would get an application together. That's one that we'll be very interested in for the Jones John Liner Road down the road. I'm not sure we can do anything with it this year because we're not quite far enough in our scoping study yet, but it has some interest to, to take a look at. And Aaron will probably talk to you about the RCO grant that uh, they're having a, uh, a uh, online session with uh, later this week. So that's everything. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes. Oh, there's a question for you, Mark. I was wondering if you have a timeline, or I haven't heard anything recently about the sidewalks for um, Rhodes Road. Is that come? I thought that was. Isn't that the next phase of that roundabout project, or is that going to be done this year? To extend a sidewalk on Rhodes Road to the uh, west. Yeah, weren't they planning to put? Um, <coughs> Sidewalks along roads, roads, because you know that's where the traffic is being diverted, and there's lots of pedestrian traffic there. Yeah, we don't have a project designed or funded for that yet, and it's actually in the county. Uh, Skagit County has uh, upgrades to roads, road in their their uh, transportation improvement program um, down the road some ways. I, I'm not even sure it's in their six-year plan. They're aware of the problems down there, as we are, and. Uh, that's, that's all I can tell you about it right now. There's no actual project scheduled for that, but it is in the tip. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just a few items for you tonight. Uh, on the days are just two items from the retreat that are just informational for you. One is Leo's presentation. Uh, and again, I apologize for not having that in the slide deck. Uh, so you've got a hard copy. I also emailed it to you. The second one is the uh, uh, the page that shows the mission, the vision, and the council critical goals and objectives, which unless you want to see it sooner, you'll see again in preparation for the 2019 budget, which Patsy is not going to be worried about. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I see that. <laughs> uh, the Northern State Cemetery, um, I had a conversation today with our friends at the state. We're, we're still working through some details on that. Um, they've proposed, well, let me back up, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, approximately two-acre cemetery. It's just outside the city's urban growth area. The proposal is that that property be transferred to the city for city ownership, and it would come with uh, $55,000 to front load the first decade of lawn mowing and the ability to give it back if we don't want it, can't make it work. Uh, so the state has said, well, you know, that all works, uh, except uh, we don't want you to be able to give it back just forever. Uh, there, there probably should be a timeline, how about 25 years? So that's a new concept that uh, I, I guess uh, you all need to think about. Uh, clearly, we need to have some ticklers in the file, so as we get into year 20s, 20 through 24, you know, and that opportunity is almost over, there's the ability for the city council of the future to say, no, you know, we don't want to have this anymore, or, you know, maybe it's working and it's not an issue. Uh, the second concern um, from the state is really kind of technically how it gets transferred to us, and um, I don't think we care, so that's something the state and the port are going to have to work out. Um, so that's that. Uh, stay tuned. I let the state fellow know that uh, you've only got two meetings between now and the proposed transfer date, so the sooner they can get some revised updates, the sooner uh, we can get through them and get them to you for consideration. If you do have feelings though, about the 25 year, now would be a good time to let me know. So I, I told them preliminarily that that did not seem unreasonable from my perspective. Is the $50,000 one time that comes at the initial transfer? Correct. Can we, does that cover long, lawn mowings for 25 years? 10 years. That's the math on that. Yeah, that's a 10 year of lawn mowings at the current cost that the state charges itself. 
I won't ask. <laughs> It is a baffling scenario uh, that the cemetery is owned by Department of Enterprise Services, yet uh, DSHS, Social and Health Services, pays them to maintain the cemetery. Uh, DSHS says, you know, it's actually not ours, so we're not sure why we've been paying all these years. And DES says, well, we don't own cemeteries, you know, we own properties that make money. You know, they actually have no independent revenue. Their, their function is uh, leasehold returns and or legislative appropriations. So they're saying, well, this doesn't work for us. And uh, Port said there's no scenario where we're taking it. So, uh, you know, the city's interest is really uh, both in the spirit of the partnership that we've been part of and also, you know, really with Councilmember Kinzer's leadership, uh, there's clearly an interest in the community in seeing that cemetery, cemetery restored. You know, as it's been kept, you know, they've weed whacked the blackberries, they've mowed, um, but there's not much there in terms of really being able to recognize and see who's there and tell that story. So you know, I think that's the broader vision for the city is really, you know, you would be stepping in to be the stewards where the state stepped out back in 1972 and, you know, the fencing, the lighting, the parking, the security enhancements, the interpretive signage, maybe the, the gravestones, markers, etc. You know, there's a, some very interesting work that could be done that could be, um, I think, appreciated by the community. That's your policy decision. Um, you should be getting invitations soon for a celebration of the Northern State Project. Uh, the governor is going to turn the keys over to uh, the port. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's an unusual project in the state process and it's been a lot of years of hard work and, and uh, that's coming up. So, so keep, keep your eye out for that. On the EMS front, uh, I put on the dais also, I think it's a two-page with a staple handout. That was the material that was provided to the first meeting of the stakeholders on the EMS. So you'll recall that when Jeff Sargent came and spoke to you, he said there's going to be uh, d details forthcoming through a series of two meetings. Uh, Chief Klinger and I attended meeting one. That was the material that was handed out. And uh, you may, may have read the article in the newspaper that seemed to feature me prominently with uh, less than joyful response to the materials that were handed out. And I, I guess I just want to make sure that if you've got any questions, let's talk about them. Uh, most of my comments that were quoted in that paper really relate to my work as a board member of the Central Valley Ambulance Authority. You know, from the city's perspective, you know, if I just have my city hat on as a BLS provider, you know, my, my only concern with what was put out is that it, it really wasn't detailed at a level that answered any of the questions that I heard city council members ask uh, Jeff Sargent that night. Uh, none, actually zero, zero answers. And so I let that be known. But the bigger issue that was raised is really structural between the largest ALS provider in Skagit County and the mothership, uh, the county government. And, and uh, I think we've got some significant concerns that we need to work through. Uh, the county, I believe, heard that. I don't think what I said was new information. It certainly wasn't different information. And, uh, you know, Dean said that years ago. I've been saying it. Everybody on our board's been saying it. It's just that uh, that meeting was about to end and nobody said anything about it. So I thought, well, we got to, you know, this isn't going to work without talking about it. So the upshot is the Central Valley Ambulance Authority Board and the Board of County Commissioners are having a joint meeting on June 4th to talk about what exactly is the relationship between the Skagit County Board of Commissioners who, uh, who create uh, appoint, uh, budget, uh, determine the bylaws and even what happens with the equipment as well as the financial accounting software that must be used for the Central Valley uh, Ambulance Authority. What is the relationship between the commissioners and the board of directors of that entity? Uh, so that question can maybe be put to rest. <coughs> So if you have any questions, please ask. Uh, Dean and I intend to uh, attend meeting two, and you know, I'll be there looking both from my city BLS provider perspective and my the city representative on the CVA board ALS provider perspective, uh, really just wanting a system that works. You know, this is so important for everybody in Skagit County to have a seamless response system for the entire county. and. Uh, um, 
you know, uh, there are just so many questions that we need to get resolved. My last uh, item for you is on the library, the new library project. Uh, we are continuing our feasibility investigation of the iron skillet. Uh, we had a drill rig out this week uh, taking investigative core samples of the land there just to look for uh, any potential issues and I expect to have those results back tomorrow. There was nothing evident during the sampling uh, in terms of potential contaminants that could be detected by sight or smell, but of course we'll pay a laboratory to do the real work. Um, so stay tuned on that. The architects have kicked off. They're working hard on the program right now. And the next milestone for that project is very likely to be on June 27th. So if you all could save that date, uh, we're going to hear after tomorrow's uh, library board meeting. You have a city council meeting that night already. What we've proposed is a joint public workshop from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m for the city council, the library board, and the public to see the 30% design plans. So it may end up resulting in pushing back your regular meeting a little bit later than seven for a start date, a time, but we'll, uh, we'll respect the agenda and make sure we get you out of here before 10. <laughs> right? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I saw that smile there. So. <laughs> Things are going well on that front, and we're just working through all those various issues, and that's it for me tonight. All right. Thank you. I have a question for Aaron. Okay. Uh, on the EMS page two, um, did they, was there any talk, I, I'm guessing since none of the questions that were asked here were answered, um, <coughs> there was no talk of under capital expenditures replacement of uh, BLS ambulance for Cedar Woolley? No. It said if you look at the bottom of that page, it says they'll consider it. But they've, they're committing to a replacement ambulance for Anacortes. Correct, the Anacortes and CVAA. And is, has there been any talk of setting a cap on uh, cost or does it, because Anacortes? Those are, yeah, they're still, those uh, talks are still going on. The uh, uh, committee is still working to write out a set of uh, vehicle specs for uh, countywide ambulance. And the, the plan is the, um, once they get those uh, specifications uh, written, uh, that'll set the maximum cost that the county will reimburse. Now, if the city or that entity wishes to go above and beyond that, uh, they're more than welcome to, but they're not going to get the free ride that they're getting now. They'll only get the set amount. Thanks, Steve. And if you'd like to see the latest in that design, tomorrow at 10 a.m. at Burlington Fire Department, the Central LA Ambulance Authority's newest vehicle, which I think is a $260,000 rig, will be pushed into the fire base and you can take a tour. See what a quarter million gets you these days. I hear you can build them for a lot less, but that's fiscally spending in Cedar Woolley. I don't actually see where it says anything about Cedar Woolley on the capital expenditures. It We're the BLS section at the bottom. We're the only BLS providers in the county. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. First time. <laughs> First time, yeah. Well, my report for tonight really is just my receiving a very well-lit torch from Patsy. And so the last couple of weeks really have been uh, working with her to try to glean everything I can from her uh, before she departs here. I've really appreciated her help and the help of the finance staff, even the departments as well, um, because right now I'm a man of a thousand questions <laughs> and uh, just trying to get up to speed on everything that's going here. So a couple things to follow up from the retreat. Um, the BIOS software has been my friend for the last couple of weeks, and I'm jumping into that to uh, see what tools and things we can use to get some of the financial information that we talked about for reporting purposes. I have a goal of the month of June of bringing that forward and seeing what things would be helpful for your decision making in that. 
And one other project, uh, the dovetail on what Aaron was talking about with the library, I'm working on putting together a, a costing model so we can track costs of the project, uh, not just the city and the library, but the district as well, so we can keep a, a really good handle on the finances for that project. So um, that's my report for tonight. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jermaine. Nothing except for um, didn't just go to the human trafficking. Um, wasn't really a seminar. It was a kind of a community event, but uh, done at the Skagit Valley College, mostly for human service students. Um, a few other folks were invited. Uh, just the way they're changing the way they look at trafficking, um, more of like a labor trafficking as well as sex trafficking and how they go about catching <laughs> the bad guys. And it's actually been working that they're they're more focusing on the bad guys and, and less on the people that are being trafficked. And uh, that seems to be helping the situation some, although it's still a big problem. So anyway, that's what I learned. That's it. All right, thank you. Brenda? Well, I'd just like to bring to everyone's attention tonight about the revitalized Willie um, think tank that's coming up on June 14th. It's going to be right here on Thursday, June 14th from 6 to 9 p.m. And it's really going to be a great opportunity for anyone who's got any interest in the downtown of our city to come out and give your ideas, speak your mind about what you like and don't like about downtown. What would you like to see? What would bring you there more? What keeps you away right now? Um, the Downtown Association is really, really committed to listening to the public and the business owners and everyone to make it all work in a way that um, everyone is happy with the outcome. So we want to invite everybody to come out right here on Thursday, June 14th. Thank you. Paula? Um, other than we are so busy at the chamber working on the um, blast from the past, that which I brought you posters and information on last time, I haven't got anything else right now. So. That's fine. Um, I do want to mention, though, the museum has some interesting things going on. If you would check their website, that would be a great idea. They've got a thing about rivers to roads. And... Oh, very good. All right, thank you. Chuck? <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to kick it out uh, for Aaron and the rest of the council that um, I don't know where you've been to Riverfront Park on the weekend or not, but it's, it's reached and surpassed its peak as far as attendance. Uh, people go down there for a picnic, they have no place. And I think it's time that we, we start thinking about adding some more picnic shelters in, in different parks, especially at Memorial Park. Uh, Nathan and I was looking and there's enough for maybe three pads there, you know, to put up a, just a little picnic shelter and where families can go there and, and celebrate a birthday or just a family get together. Uh, I don't think it would really be too expensive. Uh, another thing is, Cedarville is growing. It's not a little town like it used to be. It's growing. And I would like to see Cedarville have a park department and not just kicking guys all over town. Uh, I've, I've talked to Nathan. Nathan don't need any more of a workload. He's, he's maxed out. And I think, I know this costs money, but we should should be thinking about having a park department and have it staffed with somebody to, to run the thing and be there all the time. Uh, I would like to see the library, when it's uh, emptied out and moved, I'd like to see that building become a park department. And the library or the... the yeah, library? the old library. And then when people come to town, they, the park department, Park departments down here, you know, maybe they have questions or whatever, but it, but I think it's something that that the city and the council should be thinking about. Uh, I know it's not going to happen the next day or two, but it needs to happen in the near future. And that's all I have. Oh, I, I do want to say that our 
wonderful mayor became a, a senior citizen today. Yeah, she signed <laughs> up and she's now a senior citizen. She's eligible to go down and have lunch at the, at the senior center. So it was. It was. <laughs> I've arrived. <laughs> It was a nice day. I mean, I enjoyed being with with the mayor, and and the the old people were were really enjoying it because they, it made them feel a little bit important, you know, that the mayor would come down and have lunch with them. So, thank you, mayor. Yeah, I'm feeling a little old. <laughs> uh, Jared, I, I'm not sure how you follow that. <laughs> Um, I I don't have anything to report on. I just want to um, take a couple minutes to send my thanks to um, all of our city staff, city supervisors um, that came and presented to us at our council retreat. And thank you to those who um, work in those departments because I'm a firm believer in Cedar Woolley. We, uh, we do a lot more uh, with less resources than the, the city surrounding us. Um, I hate getting compared to to Burlington. Well, Burlington has this, and you know they have this, and it's you know we're Cedar Woolley, um, and I just I think that um, citizens need to take note at the you know our beautiful downtown and the way that you know things are upkept and and realize that we do that with uh, you know half the staff that you know most cities our size um, do and our staff does amazing things from every department um, and I just am very thankful and hope that uh, we keep good people like we have and uh, I think we've done a good job at finding uh, good new employees I'm glad to have Doug on board and you know I was thankful to see a smooth transition within that department because um, it's one of the departments that is vitally important and we have very good staff there so I think they'll be in good hands with Doug so I just want to send my thanks to all of our staff and all of um, Cedar Woolley's employees that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Jared. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just going to pick up on that because I was going to mention that too. I I want to thank the staff for taking time from your crazy, busy schedule to come out and to share uh, what the situations are, what the plans are, what your department does, what your needs are. I want you to know that we did listen after you were gone. We must have spent, I don't know, maybe close to a couple hours really just discussing and digesting everything that you shared with us. So we're listening, we hear you, and... So, uh, yeah, thank you. And I also want to thank the council for taking the time. I know that you all took time off from work. You um, worked it into your schedule. You, know, you made it happen. It was important that we were all there, and, and I want to thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, I also want to say, talking about Cedar Woolley and how well we do things here, um, once again, Cedar Woolley Housing Authority um, has earned a high performance um, from HUD. It says here in the press that the Department of Housing and Urban Development has recognized the Cedar Woolley Housing Authority as a Cedar Woolley Housing Authority as a high-performing housing authority for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2017. The authority scored Cedar Woolley at 93 points out of 100 points, and uh, which that is under the Public Housing um, Assessment System, which evaluates the overall management and operation of the housing authority. So. Yeah, we do, we do it right here. We do it well. Um, and then just one last thing. I was on um, Friday at CarQuest. They celebrated 80 years. Um, Pola had mentioned it at the last council meeting. I don't know how many of you were able to make it down there. But I went down and had a great time. They were serving all kinds of foods and homemade cookies. And there were several people coming in. And it was really lovely. It was a lovely celebration. And, and I actually heard from the family about how they've... Um, was started by the grandfather and his brother, and it's worked its way right on down to the granddaughter and her husband, so it's really great. And that's all I have. So I am going to, at this point, open up public comment. Um, it is uh, 7.59. If um, anyone is interested in giving public comment, please give your name and address and try to keep it within three minutes. Anybody? Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment then at this time. 
so we're going to move on to new business. Um, John, I see you have a couple items here. Do you want to start us off? Yes. So first of all, I'd like to thank the council for listening to staff at the retreat the other day. Um, and I, while sitting here, I noticed with Patsy leaving, Sorry, we. It's been, I think in 2015, Doug Wood retired, so it only took three years to get another Doug on this bench over at this side of the room. Huh. It's just an odd observation. But it's 8 o'clock, so let's get rolling. Um, tonight, I'm bringing the 2018 Comprehensive Plan docket to the council for a first read. Um, in 2017, we did a lot of, a lot of work, and the council uh, approved that very recently. In 2018, we wanted to keep the docket pretty light, so um, all, all the Planning Commission worked on this <coughs> time around was some zoning changes. Most of those zoning changes were uh, changes that were corrections. Uh, there's, I, I noticed several properties around town that were either owned by the city or the school district that were um, not zoned public. Typically, if a property is owned by a public entity, it's zoned public because it's used for public purposes, and so that's why that zoning exists. So look, looking over the map, I just noticed there were all these errors. Some were just errors from way back when. Others were um, new acquired land over the past one to 15 years ago <laughs> that uh, hasn't, hadn't made it in. So uh, those are all shown on the Exhibit A to both ordinances. Uh, in addition to those, there was uh, one other piece of property that uh, staff is recommending being changed from mixed commercial back to residential seven. It had been residential seven for many years. Um, and back in 2016, it was uh, changed zoning to mixed commercial. After uh, working with the property owner it, and just seeing how things have shaken out with that property, it seems better to be R7 again, so staff has recommended that it be R7. That is the totality of the changes. There's um, several pages here um, that show the process that the Planning Commission went through. There's two ordinances, and I can explain why that is. One is an ordinance to change the, uh, the comprehensive plan, and that's basically the map that is in the appendix to the comprehensive plan. And then the other ordinance is to change the zoning map, and that is just the zoning map. They're technically, te uh, they're not really connected, so that's why it takes two ordinances. It's completely redundant, and I wish I didn't have to do it that way, but that's the way it's done. And that's all I have to say. I have to say page 63 sum summed it up nicely. That was, that was a good page. <laughs> Talked about the different parcels. All right. And uh, then how about the amendments to residential recreation area regulations? Is that you again, John? Okay, yeah. So if there's no questions on the 2018 comprehensive plan docket, I'll move on to amendments to the residential recreation area regulations. So uh, whenever uh, a development is done that is either a multifamily development of uh, four units or more, or a, oh, sorry, five units or more, or a subdivision is done where it creates five units, uh, potential for five units or more. Uh, the city has a requirement that an 8,000 square foot private recreation area is, to, is included in that development. That 8,000 square feet is to have recreation amenities for a range of ages, um, from you know tots to uh, senior citizens, so you, including you know, walking paths and places to sit and, and maybe some play equipment, a basketball court, that sort of thing. Um, and those are owned by the homeowners association in the case of a subdivision, or they're owned by the owner of the apartment building in the case of a multifamily development. 
we had a request from a local developer to change the requirements. What they were looking for was uh, the ability to, instead of build that 8,000 square foot recreation area, they were asking for the option to contribute a certain amount of money to some sort of parks fund so that they, uh, especially for smaller ones, so that that money could go towards parks, but they can still get a building lot. And the argument is, in smaller subdivisions, uh, the SAP court comes to mind, where there's only four or five residential lots. Not really too sure if they're being used well, and if they're just sort of a burden on the homeowners association. So the Planning Commission had a, a good conversation about it, and uh, what, what they recommended is for smaller subdivisions um, that, uh, first they decided, yeah, they're right, these smaller ones, it's probably too much play area for you know, a subdivision of five or six lots. So they increased the number, they, they recommended an increase to seven lots and above. Um, before an 8,000 square foot private recreation area is required. In addition, they're also recommending that um, if it's 15 lots or less, so between seven lots and 15 lots, the developer has the option to contribute $15,000 towards the parks fund for parks development someplace else where it might be a little bit more useful for the community than a small private recreation area in a small-ish um, subdivision. And that would be optional. And the, the, and the dollar amount was based on what, the $15,000 amount was based on what the developer, the developers who attended the, the hearings said it would cost to develop a park. And so that's where that value came from. There's some discussion history in the, the findings of fact from the Planning Commission. So that's, that's the, the long and short of the changes to that, is to make it a little bit easier for developers uh, to create a subdivision in a smaller plat. Um, take one step back for, there was one more change in a multifamily development such as an apartment building. <clears throat> the Planning Commission recommended that between five units and, I should check, uh, <laughs> I forgot off the top of my head, uh, five and eight units, I want to say, the, the requirement be reduced to 4,000 square feet of play area instead of 8,000, and that would be the only change to the multifamily. Uh, the Planning Commission did find that it's important for there to be uh, a good amount of recreation area in a multifamily development because those tend to be smaller lots. People don't have private backyards, um, and there's not always a park right next door. So it's important for um, <clears throat> for that uh, play area to be available at a multifamily development. And actually, I've received pretty good feedback from the new 12-unit apartment building next to the subway across the street from Cascade Middle School. That has that has a private recreation area on the north side of it. You can see there's a basketball court, a couple of seating benches, just an open green area, and uh, you know, that's what a that, that's a good example of what a, a private recreation area would be. And that seems really necessary for a multifamily development. So. Um, while well, it was reduced for smaller multifamily, uh, it was not eliminated. And if it is more than multifamily of more than four units and less than nine, so yeah, so between four and eight units would require a 4,000 square foot and above nine, un nine units and above would still be required to have 8,000 square feet. Question is that okay? Sure. Um, so, if there's under seven units, then there's no contribution to the parks. So, so that's right. what the planning commission is recommending. If it's a small subdivision of, um, 
let me make sure I get this right. <coughs> uh, oh yeah, so new developments of seven dwelling units. Um, of, of more than seven dwelling units would, would be required to have the 8,000 square foot. So in a subdivision of eight units or more, you would be required to have an 8,000 square foot recreation area or you, under this scenario, you could apply for, you could uh, pay $15,000 and, <clears throat> and you wouldn't have to provide that 8,000 square feet. So a 7,000 square foot, or a seven, a seven lot subdivision would not be required to have any private recreation area. Or any contribution to? Or any contribution. And that was based on looking around seven units is, you know, if that was in the R7 zone, that would be a one acre subdivision. That's pretty small. Um, in the case of SAP, uh, court, SAP Place, which is a, the court on SAP Road, I believe that's six units, and they have that private recreation area, and it seems a little, it seems pretty underused. So that's where that's where the the number seven came from. Well, I guess I'm I'm not saying that they should necessarily have a recreation area, but maybe still contribute a little something to parks. Best well, to be using so. All new units will pay the $1,500 parks impact fees, so that doesn't change. Um, this would be this would be oh yeah uh, this would be a way for developers of uh, eight lots to 15 lots to be able to contribute a, a, a more hefty amount, but get something out of it, which a, a valuable building lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, this is the first read, no action tonight. Thank you, John. All right, moving on to number three, the real estate donation and use agreement between city and port. I believe you're up, Aaron. I don't have much more to add to the memo. Um, maybe just more for the public. The big picture view is we're looking at acquiring approximately 15 acre park at the entrance to the new Swift Center that includes the Northern State Fishing Derby Pond. The port will remain a project partner, uh, committing to 50% of the design, construction, and maintenance of the parking and restrooms, as well as 50-50 uh, split on pond maintenance for the future. Uh, in exchange, the port will have access to 50% of the parking that's ultimately built there for use at the Swift Center. So the agreement that you have before you tonight is the uh, transfer agreement between the port and the city. Uh, our intent would be to have this uh, recorded virtually, well, not simultaneously, but just after the property is transferred from the state to the port. So we'll have a deed from DES to the port, and then right after that, a deed from the port to the city, and the city would then own this on July 1st. So I'm looking for approval on the agreement, and of course, if you've got any questions, happy to answer them. On page of the packet on page uh, 89 is the conceptual, and this is just a concept design at this point. It's it's definitely not set in stone. I think there's uh, plenty of questions about what ultimately should be built there, but that's one uh, architectural conception of, of uh, the use of that property. And I definitely agree with uh, your earlier comments, Councilmember Owen, um, and have asked uh, Ke Kevin and Nathan to think about what, you know, what they could build in house. I think on this plan they're shown as 16 by 16 foot shelters, so fairly simple covered area. If I could pick, I'd give them a sink and a barbecue, but maybe they just are covered areas with a barbecue next door, kind of a thing, and uh, a place where a person could have a, a kid's birthday party or a, a little get together with without having to reserve them. And I think we could, you know, this, this plan shows uh, four of those, well, one of them larger, three small, one large. And clearly there's room for some at Bingham Park and ultimately Memorial Park as well. Aaron, if we don't put in um, one of those triple sinks somewhere out there, 
is that going to limit our use of it when it comes down to what the um, health department will allow? I don't know. The area where I've seen us run into the triple sink issue is really at Hammer Square with regard to food service operations, things like the sample, the Cedro, and the farmer's market. Um, I don't know at the park. I'm not sure we have a triple sink there, do we, at the large shelter? I think there's a double, a double sink. Yeah. I, I've, I've had discussions from the chamber's point of view on this with them, and... You get some really mixed messages um, from the health from, department. From the health department, yeah. It's pretty hard to be certain. And even today, when I was at the market, um, I guess the um, entrance to where the triple sinks are wasn't open, and a couple of the vendors were asked, well, where's your water, Where, where's your towels, you have to have paper towels, and, you know. So they were definitely being uh, reviewed by the health department today. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think the practical reality is the vendors don't really need triple sinks. They've got commissary kitchens, and that's just, they're, they're not doing dishes at the back restroom, you know, behind the restrooms of the Hammer Heritage Square. That's I know. That is truly a health department requirement. The city paid for it, installed it, and it's there so they can look at it. <laughs> and I guess we could install another one at a future park if we need them, but it's not, I mean... You know, triple sinks all about doing dishes. You know, wash, rinse, sanitize, and that—that's the. They, they just don't do that. They want the triple sink and the hand washing sink too. Yeah, yeah. I've got a question, yeah. Aaron, about the park. Um, how much land on the other side of the pond is included? You know, I actually can't quite tell. Uh, you can That's see on, yeah, on page 88, you see the uh, proposed binding site plan that shows the tracts. Um, and then if you, yeah, it's pretty difficult to overlay that to page 89. Yeah. Orientation is different for one thing. But I believe that the bulgy area that you see between tract B and division 2 is the bottom of the pond. But I can't, I, I, you know, I, I've got the same question, which is exactly how much do we have between what would be the city's park and the leased area or the retained area for um, the military department? Yeah, there is a fence there, and I'm just curious, does it go all the way up to their fence? And that's no. not a very nice backdrop for a park. Maybe no. it would require some plantings or something along that fence? Yeah, I... I I have a suspicion it doesn't go all the way to the fence because there's a parking and access area that's between the fence and the pond that I okay. believe would be part of the military department's retained property, but I don't know for sure. I think once, uh, you know, a next step for us would probably be to use this and get some staking out there just so we know uh, where everything is. The other boundaries are all really obvious. It's just yeah. that one between track to see the road uh, going then um, south to the county property in the southeast corner of what would be our future park. Okay. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, there is a request for action. It's at the bottom of page 78. Madam Mayor, I move to authorize the mayor to sign the attached real estate donation and use agreement between the city and the port regarding the new approximately 15-acre park at the entrance to the Swift Center. Second. Okay. So a motion was made by Councilman Couch and seconded by Councilwoman Kinzer. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? So motion carries to authorize the mayor to sign the attached real estate donation and use agreement between the city and the port regarding the new approximately 15-acre park at the entrance of the Swift Center. All right, so if uh, there are not any questions on the information items, we can move on to the good of the order. Is there any good of the order? I have one item. Yes? I would like to 
mention that uh, flower baskets are going up tomorrow. Yeah. And I love seeing our flower baskets downtown, and so I'm excited to see them back up again. Summer's here. Feels like they're late this year. Usually go up the weekend before Memorial Day. Okay. All right, without objection, if there are no objections, any questions, we are adjourned.